guitar. Uh, okay. If any questions about the Seahawks come up later, please let them know. Um, this week we're going to do multivariate models. And let me get into this with some empirical examples of uh, the kinds of problems that we want multivariate modeling to solve. Uh, those of you who have lived on the East Coast know about Waffle House. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so has anyone here not been to Waffle House? No, uh, well, you must rectify this probably at some point. Uh, there's some kind of reality distortion with the Waffle House, because the food is not actually good, but it tastes but it tastes really good. I, maybe it's only because I eat there at 2 a.m. when I'm drunk. But, <laughs> but, it, but, but no, it's, you know, it's like IHOP food. It's, uh, it's hash browns and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so here's the thing about Waffle House. Um, and I, I pulled this data down myself. Uh, there's a, a pretty reliable correlation between the number of Waffle Houses per million people in the different states in the United States and the divorce rate of those states. Uh, so uh, does wa is Waffle House causing divorce? Uh, of course not, right? This is one of those spurious correlations. There's a great website. If you just Google spurious correlations, you can find it, which just, I guess, magically finds spurious correlations by, by comparing two variables together in the time series of two variables. Uh, this is... Uh, this is not the kind of thing I would hope that anybody would try to publish a paper about because it's obviously spurious, right? There's no credible theory about how the presence of Waffle House could cause divorce. Uh, if you think really hard, maybe you can confabulate one. You guys are creative, so you might be able to do so. Uh, but I assert that it's an accident, right? It's uh, what we call a spurious correlation. Um, and one of the things that we like in multivariate statistics is the ability to partial out the effect of particular predictor variables and discover the one that is really uh, driving some phenomenon, driving the outcome. Um, and that's what we lean on multiple regression to do, and that will be the topic of this week. Uh, there won't be a lot of new tools um, uh, introduced, really. We'll be using similar kinds of model forms, Gaussian linear models, uh, but there'll be a lot more conceptual work and a lot more plotting this week. You'll love the plotting. Uh, uh, so... Um, uh, the major idea with multivariate models is we bring in additional predictor variables, uh, the ones that are actually driving the relationship, and then it leads the spurious ones, like the Waffle House density in a state, to no longer be partially correlated with the outcome. So in this case, the story will be, those of you who've grown up on the East Coast know this, Waffle House started in Georgia uh, in recent history, uh, from the perspective at least of archaeologists. And, uh, and it has grown organically out of, out of Georgia over time. And so uh, eventually it'll take over the world. But right now it's still mainly a southern phenomenon, as shown by this map of the density of Waffle Houses. And you can kind of see it here. In Georgia, uh, has the most. Uh, there are 40 Waffle Houses per million people in Georgia, uh, which is reassuring uh, in some sense. <laughs> uh, uh, South Carolina also has a lot, Alabama. Uh, so on. Um, and then all these ones with zero, well, it's, you know, the white stuff up there. It's in New England and the West Coast uh, and the far northern states. Uh, uh, so it's just an accident that uh, Waffle House ends up being associated with states with high divorce rates because the South uh, has higher divorce rates. Um, and we're going to explore why today in the context of this example, just uh, not because we care about that problem, because that, but because it's a good way to think about uh, multiple regression. Um, lots of spurious, co spurious correlations are routinely published, though, because sometimes it's not so obvious. Here's one. I collect these things. Uh, here's one of my favorite, the effect of country music on suicide. Uh, if you've listened to much country music, uh, and you should, really should sometimes. It's a unique American kind of music. It's like it's culturology of a sort. It's worth doing. Um, it is often depressing. It is. Uh, it's, it's, but somehow that makes you feel good. I don't know. It's a weird thing. Like, people like horror movies. They don't like being scared, but they like being scared in their living rooms. Right? So it's like with country music, you don't like being sad, but you like listening to songs about people who are sad. Uh, it's an interesting <laughs> thing to understand. But uh, so uh, turns out if you get the right data set, at least, uh, you can find a pretty strong correlation between um, uh, country music uh, listening habits uh, in aggregated metropolitan areas in the South and rates of suicide. It's not individuated data, right? They don't individual uh, data on people who've, who've attempted suicide. Um, I, I suggest this is spurious, although really it's, who knows, um, right? Here's one. 
uh, which is definitely spurious. And I think this this is a joke paper, actually. Uh, Male organ and economic growth does size matter. Um, the paper is very tongue in cheek. It's one of those things like it's so well done that you can't tell it's a joke. I think it's a joke. It's got to be a joke because this individual's other papers are quite serious. <laughs> so I think this is a joke. Anyway, if you find the the the, the key joke, the punchline in the paper is in the lower right graph. If you regress um, the difference in economic performance uh, between 1985 and 1990, measured by GDP across nations and available data on the length of the male member uh, among individuals in those nations, there is a strong negative relationship. Uh, and I assert that there is no plausible causal explanation for this. Right? Just not, I mean, I don't, I don't trust either axis on this graph either, <laughs> but there are serious data quality issues uh, involved here. But uh, this is just to say, you can find relationships. And the fact that this correlation exists does not then uh, require that we believe it, right? Because it's easy to imagine that there's something else that's correlating with both these things that's really driving uh, the relationship, like accidents of history or me uh, systematic measurement error or something like that. Um, so we're going to take a peek this week at the machinery that is most often used to deal with these kinds of issues, to um, pull out from uh, the trap of, of believing spurious correlations. Uh, and this is part of what I call the regression march. It's a long march to the sea, uh, along the way burning cities and such. Um, so last week you got the introduction, basic linear regression, and most of you have had some introduction to that before, but I hope my reintroduction to it, the rethinking of it, was useful to you. Um, you, had to, you had to do it much more mechanistically. Uh, this week we're going to do multivariate linear regression, same sort of tools, same sort of models, but it gets conceptually harder because they're more moving pieces, and there are many more ways to visualize the predictions of the models because there are more things driving the predictions now. Uh, next week we're going to do model comparison. Uh, information criteria and your introduction to information theory. It'll be the same sorts of models still, uh, but now we'll be looking we'll be looking at a formalized way to compare more than one model, uh, and that'll set us up for week five. We do interactions again, Gaussian models, multivariate Gaussian models. Again, we spend the whole week on interactions because interactions are really subtle. And after our Markov chain Monte Carlo week, we're going to need to understand interactions and how to visualize them because when we get to generalized linear models, which are if you want to say a, a fancy form of regression, um, everything in them interacts, even if you don't explicitly make it interact, which is part of the fun of generalized linear models. So uh, that's why I, I set it up this way. Usually interactions are this tiny little like footnote on something. And oh, and by the way, you can multiply some predictors together. And uh, we're going to obsess about them instead. So uh, indulge me in this march. Uh, this, this paves the way. And then starting in chapter seven, we can introduce new model types much more rapidly because you'll have gotten this, I hope, strong foundation in the basic uh, mechanics of these things. And that's where we're going. So this week, uh, here's my ambition. we we'll introduce the structure of multivariate Gaussian models in the context of a spurious correlation example. Uh, we're going to work through the good things that, that we like these models to do for us and that they can, in fact, do. The uh, first is to reveal spurious correlation, that is, get rid of the Waffle House accident. Right. Uh, convince your, your friend who's really convinced that Waffle Houses are ruining marriages, that it's not that, that it's something else. Um, and the other is, uh, which I may get to start today but may not finish, is to uncover mass association, the case where you need, there could be multiple predictor variables that are driving the phenomenon simultaneously, but none of them may apparently do so because they hide one another's effects. And this happens a frustrating amount of the time. Uh, so we'll get to that. Um, I think we'll start it today. We probably won't finish it today. Uh, and then on Thursday, we'll talk about some bad things with multivariate models. Uh, everything co comes with costs. Um, you have to be careful when you have predictors that are strongly correlated. The, these models are not magic, and they, they uh, can't tell you uh, everything about how the world really works because they're just, just little machines, remember? Um, and we'll get to introduce this problem of overfitting, which will be our, our major work next week when we talk about model comparison, which is designed to, to deal with the issue that... Um, just to, just to set it up in the shortest way I know how, overfitting is the problem that models um, that have more parameters always fit better. Always. Uh, if you fit them correctly, that is. If you make a mistake, they won't. <laughs> but if you get them to fit right, they will always fit your sample better than, than uh, a model with fewer parameters. Um, nevertheless, that, obviously this sets up a, a system where you lead to, towards madness, right? Eventually you get a parameter for every data point. Uh, and then you'll have perfect... Uh, fit to your data, uh, but you'll understand nothing. 
Uh, and so we've got to cope with this somehow. And that's why we'll spend all of next week on that issue. So let's deal with the Spurious Association. Let's leave Waffle House behind um, and instead focus on something that's a little bit more serious, where you might actually be fooled. Uh, there is a correlation in these 50 states. I uh, apologize to the international listeners. I, I have you in mind, but uh, uh, just think about the regions of your own country, if you will. I don't know if this is true in all places. But in the United States, it is true that states with high marriage rates also have high divorce rates. So... Does marriage cause divorce? Well, in the most trivial joking sense, of course it does. Right? You can't get divorced if you don't get married, I think. Well, that may be coming. <laughs> but, uh, 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 in this case, though, this is almost certainly a spurious correlation. And uh, I want to show you what's actually going on here. Uh, in, in the book, I say more about how it's not obvious. It could go either way. Uh, right? it, it could be that states with, with high marriage rates value marriage a lot and therefore wouldn't have as much divorce. So it's not clear that just the, the stock of marriage should necessarily be associated with more divorce at all. It could easily turn out differently. That's what I want to show you. In this case, this is almost, almost certainly spurious. Um, uh, let me show you the, the uh, alternative explanatory variable is the median age of marriage in different states. Uh, both of these variables are associated with the divorce rate. Uh, in different directions. So places that where people get married at a higher rate, that's what marriage, uh, by the way, the dot S means it's standardized. You'll notice there's a zero on there, right? It's not that there are negative marriages in some states. It's that that's minus one Z score, right? Um, it's positively associated with marriage rate. It's negatively associated with the median age of marriage, also standardized. So this is the average median age across the states. So median, so these are far out on the right of the right-hand graph on this slide. What you're seeing are states where um, people get married late, and in those states, there's a lot less divorce. Uh, and on the left, places where people get married young, there's a lot more divorce in those places. Question? How much divorce rate have you divorced in the population? Yeah, it's like it's per 10,000, I think. Okay, so it's not per marriage rate. Per population, that's right. Standardized to the state population, that's right. As is the marriage rate. Yeah, they have the same denominator, I believe, in these data. I got all this. I, I assembled this data set myself just from U.S. Uh, statistics, uh, I think. So I, I can't remember what that was. But in the book, I give you the URL so you can go and, and farm it all down and discover my error if there is one somewhere. Uh, so the these are both associated. So the question is, uh, which is really associated, if either of them? Um, or maybe they both are. Maybe they're both driving this phenomenon. And this is a case... Uh, as I set it up this way, where there's one of these is spurious and the other isn't, and uh, there's no suspense, right? Uh, uh, median age of marriage, um, there's a big literature on this. Median age of marriage is the best predictor. It's still a terrible predictor, by the way, but it's the best predictor of divorce. Uh, basically, people can't predict divorce very well. But if you, when people, individual couples get young, uh, uh, get married young, the, the risk of that marriage ending in divorce is a lot higher. Uh, so you can even do a control within individuals, it's funny, uh, that way. Uh, these data are aggregated across individuals, so it's the worst kind of data you want to reason with, right? It's just averages within states, uh, but it still shows the same effect. Median age of marriage is um, the best predictor of divorce in the United States. It's still not great, uh, but uh, it's the best. Uh, and marriage rate um, really gives you almost no leverage at all. So let's think what we want our multivariate uh, divorce model to do for us is to answer this kind of question. We want to say for, for either of these predictor variables, um, is there in, once we know the other predictor, is there any value in learning? So, for example, if we already knew the marriage rates in the 50 states, uh, having already, already gotten all the predictive leverage out of that variable that we could from the correlation between it and the outcome, which is divorce rate, what's the additional value in learning the median ages of marriage in each of the states? Uh, you can also view it, and that's what the multi, multiple regression does, is it answers that question. It does it for both predictors simultaneously, so it also does the other one. Once we, so as I put them both on this slide, what is the value of knowing marriage rate? Once we already know the median age of marriage, and simultaneously, what is the value of knowing mar median age of marriage once we know the marriage rate? Uh, it does them both. Uh, and the parameter estimates in these models answer those questions. Right? They're, they're partial, if you will. Uh, they're the partial influences. They're the marginal value of knowing, of learning this thing once you know the other thing. Uh, and on Thursday, that phrasing, that translation of the meaning of these, these beta coefficients in these multiple regression models will explain some of the funny behavior they have. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll 
just to, just to uh, uh, prelude a little bit, we're going to look at a model where we predict someone's height with their legs, both legs, their right and their left leg, which have highly correlated values. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, you'll see that the model gives you the right answer to a stupid question. Um, but, but I will ask the stupid question. It will be my fault. Uh, but the model will give exactly the right answer. But the answer will seem mystical. It'll tell you that neither leg predicts height. Uh, so I'll let you just think about that in the context of this case, which this, this one will behave really well. So at the bottom of this slide, I show you without priors what these models look like. Uh, probably nothing uh, uh, new here for most of you. Um, but what we do is the top line looks the same. The likelihood is still uh, ye olde Gaussian likelihood. Um, and now in our linear model of the mean, mu sub i, for state i in this case, uh, we have an intercept still. There's just one intercept. Uh, and then there are two terms, one for each predictor. There's a coefficient of now these slope parameters. Um, now we'll call them coefficients because it's not clearly a line, although in any particular dimension it is still. Um, coefficient, there's a beta coefficient for each predictor value. And then m sub i here is the marriage rate in state i, and a sub i is the median age of marriage in state i. Okay, are you with me? Make sense? Okay. Um, and then, you know, choose priors too. I'll put those up in a, in a minute. Let me take you through the anatomy here a little bit, just to make sure there's nothing mystical about it. Divorce rate in state I uh, is capital D sub I. Um, and then our two predictors each gets their own additive term. So the plus here, the fact that they're, they interact only additively, you can think of that as uh, they have independent effects. I'll say that again. That the, the fact that they're just interacting additively means they have independent effects on the outcome. And that's what we're trying to estimate. Later on, when we look at interactions, look at cases where the effect of, say, marriage rate uh, depends upon the median age of marriage, which could easily be true, uh, that it matters in different ways. Right? So if it's a bunch of really young people getting married rapidly, that could make divorce even more common. But if instead it's mainly, you know, like in San Francisco, where if anybody does get married at all, they wait until they're in their 40s, <laughs> right? Uh, and then the marriage rate could effectively be high. Say everybody reaches 40 and they get married. The marriage rate would be really high, but the median age of marriage would also be high, and then divorce rate might be low. Uh, so they could interact in some way. It turns out not to be the case in these data. Um, and then we have these two coefficients, and I put slope in quotes now because it's cognitively hard for most people to think about these as slopes because there's not, there's not clearly a line now, although mathematically there is. Uh, mathematically, there are lots of lines, but um, uh, what we actually have is, you know, a plane of predictions, and I won't indulge in trying to plot that, because I can't see 3D stuff on a screen, and so I assume other people can't. I know some of you can. You've tried to teach me, uh, but I can't do it, so I won't do that. Instead, I might, I'll might. i go back and forth and call these slopes and coefficients uh, so that you know they're the same sort of thing. What's important is not the word you use, but to understand the equation, because the equation is what's producing the predict predictions, so that's why we're going to focus on that. Uh, so when we fit these things, now I'll add some priors. Um, just very quickly on these priors, the same general horoscopic uh, kinds of priors in this case, not using any kind of domain knowledge. You want a broad prior on the intercept because who knows where it'll end up. Um, and uh, uh, weakly regularizing priors on the coefficients centered on zero, and then the uniform prior on sigma. And these will work just fine here. Uh, I, I do encourage you when you go through these examples at home to alter the priors and see. You, you're going to have to make them really strong to nudge these uh, effects away very much. Uh, but it, it's worth exploring it and seeing what goes on. Um, so and then fitting this exactly like before, you just change the mu line. Add your additional prior for the additional coefficient, and it works fine. Uh, no problem at all. Does this make sense so far you with me? Like I said, no new tools this week, really. Uh, just a lot of fluster of plotting. So you'll get very flustered with your plotting. Um, so let's look at the parameter estimates. Uh, so the first pass on interpreting these models, um, and often in journals, all people give you are these tables of coefficients. Uh, now, as I said before, I think these are terrible. They're really hard to understand. Uh, but let me run you through the standard interpretation. Um, Nobody cares where the intercept is, so just ignore it. <laughs> right? That's the usual thing. Sometimes you'll see this crazy like null hypothesis test on the intercept if it's different from zero. It's like, what is going on there? That's just software being ridiculous, right? We don't care. Uh, uh, but the interpretation would be you read um, the posterior means of the coefficients as an indicator of the effect 
uh, often people will say, of that predictor on the outcome. Uh, it's the answer, it's the cryptic golem answer to the question, what's the value of knowing this predictor once you know the others? So in this case, BM, that's for marriage rate. It's slightly negative, but notice the standard deviation is twice the size of the distance from zero. Uh, and as a consequence, the, the, the percentile interval um, has a lot of probability on both sides of zero. So, um, so this is like, well, if it has an effect, it's probably pretty small, uh, but it's highly uncertain. There's nothing really strong to say about marriage rate here. Does that make sense, how you can get that from that? We're going to look at this graphically on the next slide. It'll be much easier to see what's going on. But I want to run you through the awkwardness of just a table of coefficients so you don't do it to your readers. Um, and then uh, the BA for age, uh, median age at marriage, uh, it's also negative, um, uh, but much more so, has by coincidence the same standard deviation. Um, and so it is reliably, almost all the posterior probability is below zero. So this, is, this model is quite confident that conditional on this model and these data, your machine is telling you um, if you want to predict a uh, divorce rate, uh, you, knowing median age of marriage is really useful. Uh, knowing knowing uh, marriage rate, not so useful. If it is, probably only a little bit. I don't know. Uh, might be positive, might be negative. Uh, does that make sense how you can get that from these tables? Okay. Uh, and again, most people ignore sigma too. So uh, what you can do is plot these. Uh, all I'm doing here is plotting marginal posterior distributions. If you just go plot the precy, it'll make this dot chart for you. Um, and this is the kind of thing when you get good with uh, your R skills, you can make yourself and make it prettier. I make my graphs ugly just to inspire you to do better. <laughs> right? And uh, it's not because I'm lazy, no. It's to inspire you. <laughs> and uh, might be a little of both. <laughs> but uh, I like these Spartan graphs, right? <laughs> uh, so... All it's doing is taking the means and the percentile intervals and putting them on this uh, common estimate axis. Right? When you usually when you focus on zero for the coefficients, and you see coefficient for uh, marriage rate, it's close to the mean is close to zero, and there's a lot of probability on both sides, but it's not very big effect if it does matter. Um, and then uh, for median age of marriage, very reliably negative. Right? So that that means one is negative. And you're already, you're trying to do the gymnastics in your head, right? Okay, wait, so as median age of marriage increases, that decreases the outcome. That's why it's negative. Um, uh, but we're going to do a lot of plotting today, so you don't have to do that kind of gymnastics uh, when we go through. Does this make sense so far? All right. So let's review what we know so far. Once we know median age of marriage, there's little additional value in knowing marriage rate. There might be some. Uh, it's uncertain. Uh, once we know marriage rate... There's still value in knowing median age of marriage. Um, if we Now, here's the thing I want to emphasize. If you don't know the median age of marriage, there's definitely value in knowing the marriage rate because it's correlated with the median age of marriage. That's how this whole spurious thing arises, is that things are correlated. States where people get married young, so the median age of marriage is low, also have higher marriage rates. But higher marriage rates are not actually driving the variation. We're going to try to, I'm going to, try to show you why and how, you can, how the model figures that out in a moment. Yeah, Katrina. So are these um, data standardized to each other, or are they based on the units that you put into them? question was, are these beta standardized, uh, uh, or are they, they have the units of the predictor variables? It's the latter in this case. These are not standardized coefficients. And standardized coefficients don't come out of the model unless you standardize the predictors first. Um, in this case, I did standardize them, so they come, they're in z-score units. Uh, but, the old, the, but that's the units that they were in. That's the way I want to think about it. Yeah, but it's a good question. Um, I'm not a big fan of standardized predictors because I care about the outcome scale, uh, uh, but um, other people are, and that's fine. Uh, economists really love them, and, you know, economists don't listen to me, so I won't bother to give them advice. Yeah. But, uh, all right, so. Uh, they're, they're, it's a rate. So it's, these beta coefficients have units. There's a box in the, in the book about this, I think in chapter four, I think it was about units. If you have a physical science training, you're used to carrying units through. It's a great way to check your math, actually check your algebra. And these, all of these parameters have <coughs> units on them. So in this case, these beta coefficients will be um, units of the outcome per unit of the predictor. Right. Right? right. So it makes them, what's their units? Well, it's a rate. 
right? It's something per something. And the denominator here is the z score. And the top part is the outcome. But I think Katrina was asking about the denominator part, or at least that's the way I'll read it. Uh, think about it. But yeah, good question. Um, if those of you who are confused by this, there was a box in chapter four about this. If it, if it helps you, if it doesn't, don't worry about it. You don't necessarily need it. But um, if, like, you come out of a physics or chemistry background, you're used to carrying units through all of your work. And sometimes people do it in biology, but usually not, right? Units just evaporate in biology for some reason. Uh, and then the social sciences don't ask us to categorize anything. It's just like numbers. But um, uh, but it can be useful for checking your equations, sometimes figuring out um, how things work. Uh, later on, we'll have models where parameters, uh, some of the parameters are probabilities, and those are unitless. So you can confuse yourself sometimes uh, in these things. Okay. Um, Right, so the tough part of the work this week is dealing with all the different ways you can plot uh, uh, these models to help understand them and do posterior predictive checks. So I'm going to show you a number of different ways, and this is kind of horoscopic advice again in the sense that in the context of your own work, there'll probably be a way which is most useful given your purpose and the things you're interested in. So that's why I want to give you some experience with different forms of plotting uh, the predictions of these models and see a way. Even with a model this simple, it's just about the simplest multiple regression you could have, uh, there's only three uh, predictors, right? three variables, one outcome and two predictors, there's still a really large number of useful ways to plot uh, the implications of the model. So I'm going to show you several. All the code for producing the graphs I'm going to show you is in the book. Um, there'll be a couple points where I actually stuff, pause and talk about the code a little bit, but mainly not because we're just doing the stuff we did before. Link and sim or doing it yourself with your own custom link function. Uh, it's the same tools as we did before. The models are just a slightly bit longer, right? The only trick, and I'll emphasize this when I get to it, um, is for a particular kind of, of plot, which number two in this list, the counterfactual plots, those are cases where we hold the other, some set of predictors constant while we vary one of them in order to get counterfactual predictions about that thing. So I'll come back to that when we get there and show you how to do it in code. So just bear with me. Otherwise, uh, it's it's just draw, calculating stuff and drawing it, and the code is in the book to do it. But it, by all means, if you have questions, bring them in, start next time, and I'd be happy to spend some time on it. Okay, so I'm going to go through um, three useful types and show you some multiple examples of each. First is actually just an excuse to try and explain to you how the model does what looks like magic but isn't uh, by showing you something called predictor residual plots. Uh, so how does how does this model figure out that marriage rate is not actually correlated. Uh, and I gave you a hint before, marriage rate and median age of marriage are correlated with one another. States that where people get married young also have a lot of people getting married. Uh, uh, and so, and they're both, uh, then one of them, median age of marriage, is, is strongly correlated with divorce rate. Uh, so then how does the model figure that structure out actually? The hint is there's, there are what are called partial correlations. But I want to Instead of emphasizing the algebra of that result, I want to show you graphically how to make posterior predictive plots which have that partialing done in them. And this will, I hope, uh, help you understand what the model is doing somehow. Then we'll look at counterfactual plots, which are mainly useful for understanding the implications of the model. They're counterfactual because the predictions you can make can be completely bonkers. You can invent a state with any combination of median age and marriage and marriage rate you like and see what the model says. Uh, that's why it can be bonkers. So obviously they must be tied to some extent. Demography guarantees that the two will be associated. You can't perfectly decouple them. And yet in our in our plots, we can't because we're gods here. Uh, uh, and we'll get to posterior prediction checks. I'll show you a little garden of varieties of them you can do with these models um, that show you different things. And I'm, number four, I won't show you, but I want to encourage you to always think about what you want to do. Uh, as you get more experience and confidence in this business, you'll have opinions about this for the kinds of problems you work on. Okay, so for predictive residual plots, this is a very standard kind of plot. Lots of software packages do it automatically for you, as usual. In this course, we're going to do it ourselves. Um, the goal of these is to show you the association of each predictor with the outcome, having controlled for the other predictors, where control means answering that question that was the motivation of the multiple regression. Once we know all the other predictors, that's what control means, what's the value of learning this one that I'm focusing on? That's what control means here. Um, I put control in quote in scare quotes, and it is meant to scare you in the sense that control is a term that comes from experimental design. There's no experimental design here. I've just harvested a bunch of data from the internet and run a regression on it. Uh, there's no like random assignment of people to states or marriage ages, right? That would be the best thing. If we randomly assign each of you to get married at a certain age, 
and then we could really pull these things apart experimentally. That has not been done here. But there's this contamination of experimental design language into statistics. And if, if, it, if you let it creep into your mind, it'll, it's like a mind control device. It'll convince you to be overconfident in the model. There's no real control going on here. This is just statistical control. Uh, it's parceling out. So if these are the only variables that matter, and this model has the right structure, then it is telling you how the world works. But that's a lot of ifs, right? Uh, so that's an issue. And there could also be uh, how your sample arises could matter as well. We'll have some examples of that later in the course. All right, so here's the basic recipe. We'll run through it um, in, in a lot of detail. Uh, first, you regress each predictor on the other predictors. Right? The outcome is not involved in the first step here at all. Just each predictor on the other. So this is measuring the association between, in this case, marriage rate and median age of marriage. That's the first step. So measure that association. Then you compute something called residuals. Uh, some of you already know this term. This is the variation left over after you've accounted <coughs> for the association among the predictor variables. Then you take these residuals and you regress the outcome on those, meaning you predict the outcome using just the, the variation that's left over once you've taken out all of the association among the predictors. And internally, uh, this is what the model has already done. But we're going to focus in on it and do it step by step. And this will allow us to make a plot uh, and... Uh, You'll be able to see the data in a different way, I hope. Okay, so here's the first part of that. Step one, we're going to regress marriage rate on median age of marriage. So this is asking, how well can we predict marriage rate for a state when we know the median age of marriage in that state? I've already hinted they're, they're associated quite strongly for basic reasons of demography. Um, and uh, there are more young people alive, right? So, I mean, if we assigned everybody, you can only get married. You have to live to 80 to get married. I assert that the marriage rate will go down. Just because not everybody will live that long, I'm sorry to say. Uh, especially anthropologists. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, anthropologists. I like, looked over at you guys at the same time I said that. That was macabre. <laughs> um, so, uh, hey, field work is dangerous. There's a couple of this stuff, right? <laughs> Things lay eggs in your, uh, in your body and all kinds of stuff happens in the field. And, and, so, uh, so we're going to regress uh, marriage rate of mean age of marriage. No surprises about this model. Yeah, or are there? Any questions about that model? Makes sense? Uh, the action, again, is the mu line. Uh, it, this is a simple bivariate regression. There's only one predictor. Outcome is marriage, marriage rate, m sub i, and predictor is median age of marriage, a sub i. Uh, the code is at the bottom. Um, this is what the relationship looks like. If you, the solid line there is the map regression line that comes out of this model, uh, plotting marriage rate against median age of marriage. Uh, strong relationship. Uh, now the next step is we compute residuals, which is the distance of each outcome value from the expectation, where the expectation is taken from the map regression line. Now you can also you can get the posterior uncertainty into this too. Uh, I'm not going to do this as an example because I want this to be cognitively transparent. But you can certainly do that. You could calibrate the uncertainty about this as well, uh, just by running over all the samples uh, from the posterior. But we'll just focus on the map line because it'll make the lesson easier to get in this case. Um, so here uh, I'm just pulling out, there's a mu assignment line here. I'm using the function cof to pull the map values out of the fit model. Um, and then I'm using the subsetting to pull them out by name. This is a trick that can save you some, some grief sometimes. Uh, but that is just the linear model there uh, that I put in. So for each state, its median age of marriage goes into that line. So we get 50 predictions because there's 50 states in the data set. Uh, and then we compute residuals by just subtracting that expectation. Now there's 50 expectations in the symbol <coughs> mu. For each of those, we subtract that from the actual observed um, marriage rate in each state. And that gives us the error sometimes, people say. It's the error of the model. It's not, you know, so we can be careful with the word error because it can sound bad. Uh, it's just a leftover amount. I like residual because it's like a leftover thing, right? Um, does this make sense so far? But that's what a residual is, and it's that easy. Uh, for the canned model fitting routines in R, like LM, uh, there's a command. I think it's resid, right? It calculates residuals. I haven't used it in a long time, but I think it's resid. Um, so let me show you what those residuals look like. They're the uh, line segments on this graph. So each of those blue points is an observed combination of marriage rate, median age of marriage across states. The solid black uh, line that's sloping down towards the right is the map regression line. 
right? This is the mean posterior alpha and beta um, for all the possible lines that have been ranked in the posterior distribution. Remember, your, your little Bayesian golem is saying, okay, I'm going to consider all the possible lines that you connect these, and I'll give you a posterior ranking of all of them. And this is just the one that's at the mean. And uh, then we, we draw these vertical lines. Those are the lines that we got by doing the subtraction on the previous, right? The distance of those lines, how long they are, are the residuals. Uh, so it's how far the actual outcome is from the expected central prediction of the model. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so let's focus in for a second and see uh, what value this is. Let's zoom in on that little part. Um, that took me 30 minutes to do that animation, by the way. <laughs> um, so it's my technical skills. Uh, so zoom in on that uh, here. Uh, we've got a, a little cluster of states, some of which are below the line and above the line. So how, do you, how can you interpret this? Uh, for these that are below the line, the observed marriage rate is less than what was expected by the model. Right? Uh, so these states, you can think of, they have a low rate of marriage for their age of marriage. I'll say that again because this is, if you're paying attention, this will be confusing. So if you're not confused, please pay, please pay attention. <laughs> uh, uh, these states have a low rate of marriage for their age of marriage, according to the model. Does that make sense? People are getting, are getting married slow here for the age at which they get married across the whole sample. Um, in contrast, the ones abo states above the line, these have a, a marriage rate that exceeds what the model expects on average. In these states, you have a high rate of marriage for the age of marriage. People are getting married fast uh, relative to the age at which they get married. Yeah, you with me? So this, this accounts, then this regression line is accounting for the association between these, and the residuals are what's left over that's, in a sense, unexplained by the model. Uh, and we're going to look at the, if there's anything left over, any additional value of learning uh, uh, of, of the variation that's left over here, we'll be, we should be able to see that in any correlation that remains between the predictor uh, and these residuals. And that's what we're going to do next. When we ask step three, how is divorce associated with residual marriage rate? So it's the variation at a per state basis, uh, the residual that was left over um, uh, in each state in the marriage rate. Is that associated with divorce? So we've taken out the effect of median age of marriage now. We've got still some variation in marriage rate. We want to ask, is there any association between that remaining residual error and the observed uh, divorce rates? And this addresses the question directly that we started with the multiple regression. Once I know all the other predictors, is there any value in knowing this one? So we've taken out the association with the other predictors, and we've only got some additional residual variation now. We want to see if that's associated with the outcome. So uh, graphically, let me show you how this looks. This is the residual plot we had before. This is still marriage rate on the vertical against median age of marriage at the bottom. We took out the association between these two. So then we get some residual, what's left over in marriage rate that hasn't been explained by median age of marriage. Right? Speed of marriage unexplained by age of marriage is one way to think about this. Um, uh, and above the line are states that are getting married faster than expected, below the line slower than expected. When we plot, now in the graph I've just added up here on the right-hand side of this slide, the vertical axis is now the outcome variable of interest, divorce rate. Notice the scale has changed. And the horizontal axis uh, is the vertical axis from the plot on the left. It's the residuals, the marriage rate residuals. So it gives you the fast, slow scale according to the expectation of the model we ran. Um, so now there's this dividing line that was at the meet at zero residual. So this vertical dashed line in the graph on the right, that's the map regression line in a sense between the other two variables having been taken out. Uh, and then uh, states to the right of that are ones where people get married faster than expected for their age uh, and marriage. And to the left of it are states where people get married slower than expected um, uh, for their age and marriage. And then we just run an ordinary regression between these uh, predicting divorce using the residuals. The code's in the book to do that, but I think you can probably imagine what it looks like. <laughs> and uh, I probably don't have to persuade you too hard that there's not much action here. Right? There's nothing, uh, the, the, line, the points on the right-hand side of the vertical dashed line are basically in the same range of divorce rates as the ones on the left. There's no systematic imbalance on the two halves. Right? So there's no apparent linear relationship between these two things. Yes, question? I'm confused about the, the rate. Yes. That, that's not the age. 
Right. I know Ponga means. It's, it's the number of people getting married per capita, so it's a rate. And that's what I mean by faster or slower, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, it is confusing. I've, I've tortured myself over how to word this, and it's, it's tough. Yeah, question? No, I, I still don't understand. So that means, can you just give an example? Like the one at three down there, that means that there are more old people getting married than would be expected? Okay, so you mean like over here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, in the left-hand side graph. Uh, so this state that has this big residual up here, and it's got... Um, it's got some high median age of marriage, so people are getting married old. I wish I knew which state that was. We'll, we'll plot some, up, some labels up later, and maybe we'll see. Yes, in this state, people tend to, the, the total rate of marriage, the number of marriages per capita, uh, exceeds the model expectation by a lot, because uh, in, on average, states with people get married old don't have that much marriage. So this state has a lot of marriages. People are getting married at a fast rate. Uh, relative to the age of marriage, right? Maybe the word fast is not helping. It works for me because think about rates. Rates can be fast and slow. Uh, so there's, there's lots of marriages per capita in that state, despite the fact that people are being married old. Could there be a higher or a lower rate? <laughs> Could be higher or lower. I think fast and slow. Yeah, maybe this is just me being autistic. You know, you should learn to expect from me occasionally. <laughs> but uh, did that help? Did that make sense? So maybe this is like Vegas. Uh, people go there for their second marriages. <laughs> so, uh, would that be still largely true? Uh, Florida, yeah. So, Florida, you know, it's a great thing. Yeah, Florida. Southern Florida would be, it might be like this as well, uh, where uh, the average age of marriage is pretty high, uh, but there's still a lot of it. Uh, in most places where the average age of marriage is high, people don't get married as much. Uh, does that help? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, all right. Other questions about this? Um, as a, so this residual plot shows that there's not really much effect um, or the married rate of getting, uh, yeah, there's not much effect in this residual plot um, for an added extra marriage. That's right. So the question was, this shows there's not much effect. That's right. And in fact, the slope of that, that black line in the right-hand graph is the slope we got from the multiple regression. It's the same slope. Okay. Because this um, is invisibly how the multiple regression works internally. You just don't, this is rescaled it in a sense. Now, if this, if, if instead the residuals were to show the opposite, that this, this predict actually was important, is it, in, is it just that it would be a tight correlation, or does it matter on the left or right hand side? The slope, I'm going to show you that next. Okay. Gotcha. So exactly right. Yeah, the question was, if it were, if it were the other predictor, what would it look like we're going to do that? So it's a great question. Yeah. And this is, by the way, I want to emphasize, this is hard. I mean, this is like talking to an oracle at Delphi. Right, it's like the oracle sees it but can't talk to you. Right, just gives you some prophecy, like yeah, and on when the moon's in the house of whatever, if you kill a goat, then you can be king. And <laughs> uh, so it's like the advice here. So I'm willing to spend a lot of time. I was a classics minor in college, some of you know that. So this like Greek nonsense will spew out of me at any moment sometimes. But uh, 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 so this stuff is hard. So I'm willing to spend a lot of time just going through. Through this, the hard part is not the mathematics. The hard part is under is translating between the, the logic of the world and then your criticism of the model. Uh, and it's hard to figure out in the first place just what the model thinks because it doesn't speak English, right? It speaks probability distributions, uh, and that's all it speaks. So it's a little hard to work through it. So I'm willing to spend time, and you've got to be patient with yourself. Uh, it does take time to kind of get adapted to this, and you really learn this stuff with your own problems because then you have the domain knowledge about what the variables mean. And that's when it can make some sense to you, right? You know things about the data, and that grounds your interpretations. With my examples, if you're familiar with the nature of the data, you'll be doing better than your classmates. And I just ask you guys to, well, first of all, bug me about it, and I'll try my best, but also help one another about it. Um, and I tried to vary the examples in the course so that everybody's uncomfortable sometimes, uh, just to go through it. But I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the fact that this is weird. Uh, and it's your domain knowledge of the empirical matter of it and the nature of the measurements and where the samples came from that resolves a lot of the ambiguities in model interpretation when it's your own work. So it'll seem easier when you do your own stuff. It really will. Uh, this happens over and over again. Uh, so this is a little bit more terrifying and weird than it will seem uh, when you have your own data in hand. Um, okay, let's do the other case. Uh, how is divorce associated with residual marriage rate? Just to summarize, um, 
not much at all. There's a very slight negative correlation, but you see the bow tie uncertainty is broad. That negative correlation, that's the map line, is minus 0.18, which is what we got in the multiple regressions, the same slope. Even though it's all been scaled differently, the residuals are, are on a different scale than the original predictor, but we get the same inference because internal to the multiple regression, this is what it's doing. So you can include st uh, states with high, low rates of marriage, uh, for age of marriage, do not on average have uh, 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 high, low divorce rates. So I'm not going to run through the calculation for doing it the other way. Um, but I'll show you on the next slide graphically how it's implied. Uh, all the codes in the in the book, though, it's the same idea. Uh, we're just going to flip the predictors around. So let me let's take a look at that, and I'll run you through the summary real quick, and we'll get to it. So on this, on the left, uh, the left-hand column has the analysis we just did. In the upper left, um, I think I've got some animation here that makes it like limp up. Yes, there we go. Uh, so uh, that is the first. Um, a regression we did where we predict marriage rate using median age at marriage, right? And then we computed those residuals, which are little line segments. And then in the um, bottom left, uh, we then predict divorce rate using those residuals, and we see that there's not a lot going on, right? It's highly uncertain, but if there is anything going on, it's not too super important. That's what we learned. Uh, to do the same thing, for uh, median age at marriage, we just flip these axes. So now in the upper right, uh, it's just like the plot in the upper left, but it's rotated. So now we're predicting median age of marriage using marriage rate, right? And this gives us a different coefficient, although it's in a sense the same bivariate relationship. And we get a different set of residuals. So now there's error left over in median age of marriage after having accounted for marriage rate. Did I say that again? There's a lot of marriage going on here. Right? It's the residual error left over in median age of marriage after having accounted for the association between median age of marriage and marriage rate. So there, up in that graph in the upper right, there are some states where people above the map line where people get married old for states with that rate of marriage. Right? So you think about, if this is what's weird about these models in a sense, is every state has a different marriage rate for the most part. There might be a couple that are tied. Uh, and every state has a different median age of marriage for the most part. There might be a few that are tied. Uh, and yet what the model is doing through the regression line is it, it's constructing an imaginary set of states with the same marriage rate. And then it's saying, okay, how much variation is left over in their median age of marriage still? And is that what's left over associated with the outcome? And that's what it's doing. I can say that again. So the model does it invisibly. Is it, it imagines, it constructs from your model. Right? It's not magic. It doesn't know actually in the world. But it says, okay, you think it's a line that relates these things together. Okay, your funeral. <laughs> and uh, assuming it's a line, then I can imagine, you know, a mythological Georgia and a mythological Alabama that have the same marriage rate. Right? It's like the, the, the model imagines manipulating them so that it makes the people in those states get married at the same rate. And then if there's any difference uh, in their median ages of marriage, it, are those differences associated uh, with divorce rates? after you've accounted for that. That's what the model imagines. It does these little internal experiments based upon the assumptions you put in from the model, the linear associations. So there are a bunch of states above that line uh, where people get married old for the rate of marriage in that state. Uh, and then there are a bunch of states below the line where people get married young for the rate of marriage in that state. Right? So this is taking out the association between the two from those residuals. And then in the final plot in the lower right, uh, we predict divorce rate with the age of marriage residuals. And so again, that vertical dashed line, sort of where the map line was before, that's any, any state that's right on that vertical line was exactly on the map line. Right? And there's some that are pretty close. Some states get really close to the expectation. Yeah, and there's almost no error left over. But there are lots of states that are on both the left and the right. Um, in those states where people get married younger than expected, uh, they tend to get divorced more. Right? There's more higher points over there higher divorce rates on the left-hand side of the line. Um, and in states where people get married old uh, for the rate of marriage, there tends to be lower divorce rates in those states. And so when you compute the regression line, it's reliably negative. And the slope of that line is about minus one. It's the same slope we got when multiple regression was formed. Yeah? Uh, and in the event that there were more uh, parameters to like throw in, you take the residual of, the, of these bottom uh, I guess, uh, values um, and then 
plot the residuals for that against another value, and then you can take the residuals of that and plot it against another value. Uh, maybe I'm not sure I understood your question. You 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 uh, you do them all. These these regressions at top would be multiple regressions. Right. You have all of the ones, all of the other predictors you want to take out. You put them all in that model at the same time, and you get residuals for one particular predictor, and then so you'd have bivariate regressions at the bottom, and you could do the visualization that way. Was that what you were asking? I'm not sure. I toyed with the idea of doing this example with three predictors, and I thought, no, this is hard enough as it is. Uh, but that's how it would be. If, when you reach a problem like that and you have that question, just bug me about it, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you my opinion. Yeah, question? So when you get a result for a um, strong predictor from a multivariate model, do you ever need to do this with the residuals to track the predictor as the chart goes? Uh, the question was, when you when you get a result for some predictor is strongly associated with the outcome of multiple regression, do you always need to do this? No. Uh, this is just a way to visualize it. This isn't the same thing as a posterior prediction check. I'm going to do those in a bit. Uh, just to check that the model actually fit correctly. Um, I think you want to do that, you need to generate predictions for each state using all the predictors simultaneously to do the posterior predictive check right. So we'll look at that as a separate, but it's a good question. This is an interpretational thing, and it's, it's often really useful. You'll see this in, in papers a lot, where they'll, there'll be some residual axis, right? They're showing you the association in a multiple regression context between the outcome in one of the predictors, one, particularly the one that supports their theory, right? And uh, and it will be on some mystical scale. This is that scale. It's the residual scale, having partial out to others. Most software packages, as I said, will do this for you. You just tell it to make residual plots, and these magically appear, and you know there's something waved its wand and they appear. This is how it's done. So now you can cook them up yourself uh, uh, if you want to, um, uh, and do it. Okay. So here's my little um, sermon about statistical control again. Uh, Always remember, linear multiple regression answers the question, how is each predictor associated with the outcome once we know all the other predictors? As I said, on Thursday, we'll have an example of how this explains even confusing behavior of these models sometimes. Um, you do have to be careful. Uh, uh, this is still conditional on the model, right? Uh, it could be really a goofy thing. It's, you, the model gives you the, ans uh, the answer in the form of a posterior distribution to the question you ask, and the question is embodied in the model. And so... Uh, you do have to do model criticism always. You can't get cocky about this. Uh, for example, is this really linear? I doubt there's a linear relationship between these things. And in fact, um, uh, in this case, one of the things I like about this example is it's really easy to do model criticism in the sense that, uh, look, we know something about, if you will, the physics of this. There's demography involved. Why not start with demographic, the demographer's equation, right? Uh, the, number, the stock of marriages, you do a stock and flow model. Uh, those of you who, who've done some demography or, or done population biology training, you know what I'm talking about. You've got the stock of marriages at any point in time in a state is, well, it's the number of new marriages minus the number of divorces and deaths, right? So you've got basic de demographic equations which define these variables, and you want to estimate the, the rates in those equations, not the mystical linear regression, right? So we can do a lot better really quickly here. Uh, the same is true very often in biology, right? If you're trying to study population dynamics, well, then use the equations for population dynamics. <laughs> uh, linear regressions, you can get away with it sometimes, but it's very easy to do better because we know the physics, if you will, of the system in those cases. Um, so I like this case because it's one of these rare cases in the social sciences where demography tells us how to structure the equations if we care to do it that better way. Uh, in this data set, since it's all aggregated averages, um, it would be hard to do, but you could get the finer data and do a better job with it. And that's how people actually study these things. At least I hope. I'm really not sure about that. So yeah, um, I have this point on here. Don't get cocky. The marriage rate may still be associated with divorce for some of the states. So this model is just saying on average. It's not allowing different regions to have different relationships among these things. And so you could get misled. And we'll, we'll better cope with those sorts of issues later on in the course. Um, but it may be that... Uh, uh, these variables behave in different ways at different places. In fact, when I show you the posterior predictive checks, uh, uh, I think you might be convinced, like me, that they probably do. Um, and still, we want to make causal inferences, but these are average data. We, 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 what we really want are individuals and their ages at marriage and the half-lives of their marriages, so to speak. Right? We'd like to know the half-life of a marriage for every age that people get married at, right? given the marriage rates in particular states. Um, uh, we don't have that data. and I, In fact, I don't think that data is available at all. Uh, you'd have to put it together with a lot of footwork, going to courthouses and things, and copying tickets and writing them down, things like that. Okay. Uh, counterfactual plots. 
the point of uh, the previous plotting, well, really, it was an excuse to help you understand how multiple regression works, and I hope it did that a little bit. It made your head burn a little bit. You'll really get it later. Um, we still have this issue of interpreting the model in the sense of what does the model say is the, the impact of changing uh, a predictor uh, value on the outcome. And if you're really good, you can read that off of coefficients. But uh, you don't have to be good. You can just make pictures uh, and get it that way and also do calculations. So I call these counterfactual plots because we're going to do the impossible in generating these predictions. We're going to hold all the other predictors constant at some value we choose. And then we're going to vary the others. Uh, and again, I think for these predictors, that's not possible in the real world because if you change the age at which people get married, you change the rate of marriage just because of demography. Uh, it may not change it a lot, but it's got to change it some. And in the real world, that's often true. You don't have magical control over all the predictors. Even if you could do the experiment, you would induce correlations between these things uh, for variables like this. And, uh, but in the world, in the small world of the model, we can do the impossible. And we can hold marriage rate, for example, constant. And then we can change median age of marriage and see what the model says would happen. Uh, and these are called counterfactual plots. Um, and uh, showing you two examples here. Uh, so we can compute, uh, uh, I'll show you on the next slide. We can compute for some change in marriage rate without changing the median age of marriage. What's the impact on divorce? That's the plot in the upper left. So what I've done here, uh, at the top of this graph, you see I've labeled median age of marriage equals zero. Zero means the average, which is the standardized predictor. So we set, it's like we're saying, for some state with an average median age of marriage, if, if, it, if we manipulated its marriage rate, and that's what's being manipulated on the horizontal axis of this graph, what does the model say would happen? And again, the black line is the map prediction, which says it might go down a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, the bow tie there is the uh, confidence interval of the map line. And then the lighter gray area is the prediction interval for the actual observations, right, that sigma is used in. So the, you might think the dark bow tie is link, and the light, slightly bowed part is sim uh, from last week. Uh, the functions you're fighting with in your homework, right? Um, does that make sense so far? Uh, so again, what's the value? Well, it lets you see that the model says uh, ignoring, controlling for, this is the pure controlling for, if you could experimentally manipulate states, this is what you'd like to do. This is the data you'd like to observe, right? But you, you can't. Uh, holding median age of marriage constant, adjusting marriage isn't expected to have any, marriage rate isn't expected to have hardly any effect on divorce rate, according to these data in this model. In contrast, on in the upper right, we can change median age of marriage without changing marriage rate. We set marriage rate to its mean. And then we adjust median age of marriage from, you know, minus two uh, up to three. That's, that's in z-scores, standard deviations. And we see a big change uh, expected in divorce rate. Okay. Does that make sense? And you already knew this is what I was going to say, but this is a clear indication of what the model thinks according to these data. Um, uh, clear question here is, uh, what do we set the unobserved predictors to? In this case, on the left, median age of marriage is unobserved. At the top, we set it to zero to its mean. And then on the right, we set marriage rate to zero to its mean. Um, for linear regression, it really doesn't matter uh, because they don't interact at all. Right? It'll just change the absolute level of uh, what you set the other two. You might as well set them to their mean because it really doesn't matter. It, it won't change the shape of the line at all. That will not be true when we get to generalized linear models. So when we get to generalize linear models, all predictors interact always. And it will matter what you set things to. And then we'll revisit this issue, and we'll have anxiety about it. And that anxiety will last you your whole life. <laughs> I anticipate. Well, no, I mean, your domain knowledge will help you. But it'll also explain to you why everything interacts when we get there. This is just a pregnant promise for now. Um, but right now, it really doesn't matter. It will just change the units on your vertical axis. But the, everything will look the same, and you'll make the same inference. But that won't be true once we get into the fun and constrained spaces of generalized linear models, which is most of the data you will have in your career probably will need a generalized linear model. So you're welcome. Um, does this make sense? The code for making these is in the book. Uh, it's very much like um, uh, the other things. There's going to be an example coming up in the posterior predictions where I show you how to set some of these equal to fixed values. You can imagine how to do it. But I'll, I'll, it's coming up uh, in a little bit. Okay. Um, we still need to do posterior predictive checks because if your software is like mine, well, actually, your software is mine in this case, but uh, if your software is like mine, 
even when the software works correctly, you don't always. <laughs> and so things may not go right. And then sometimes it's the software's fault. And uh, uh, sometimes randomly just doing it over again, it works, right? Because you're, there's a sunspot or something that makes your computer mess up. And so we always need to check our work. Uh, that's the first thing for posterior predictive checks, or you might think of them as retrodictive uh, checks. Um, but the other function is to stimulate imagination and think about model deficiencies. What is it, what, for which states, in this case, is the model doing a particularly bad job at? Does that give us hints about what's missing in understanding these phenomena? And that could lead to new rounds of data collection and, and modeling, and that makes it progressive, uh, makes it going, makes it uh, a productive exercise, part of the design loop that happened in the, that I talked about in the first week. Um, so in this, when we do posterior predictive checks, we want to use all the uncertainty in the posterior. So we can see sometimes the model is saying, I can't predict anything. It's just this big flat field of equally probable stuff, and I don't know what's going on. If you ignore the uncertainty in the posterior, you'll miss the fact that the model actually doesn't expect anything. Uh, I used this example last week of when you have the right model about uh, uh, primary sex ratio in humans, that is that you can't predict it, right? You expect a half, but for any particular birth, it's like maximally uncertain, right? The, it's like maximum entropy is when it's at a half. So uh, you can't, it's hard, very hard to predict human primary sex ratio uh, in human populations. Uh, and a model that gets the right answer will know that. Uh, posterior distributions can also be highly uncertain. And you only see that uncertainty when you use the whole distribution to generate predictions. So we're going to still carry that strategy forward. And again, it's, it sounds hard maybe, but it's easy to do if you just use samples. And then you're doing integral calculus, really fancy integral calculus without knowing it. Uh, but that's all it is. Integrals are just sums. Take a bunch of samples, sum over them, you're doing integral calculus. Uh, we just need enough to approximate the area. So uh, the first thing to note is that the rethinking package provides this unglamorous, or let, 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 well, let's just say, it provides an ugly default kind of plot for fit models if you use post-check. Uh, post-check for a fit map or map to stand model does this. It takes every case in the data, arrays them on a horizontal axis, and then on it computes the uh, model expectations for the outcome on the vertical. So the little blue points are the observed. They're the raw data for each state. Each case on the, on the horizontal axis is a state from 1 to 50. Um, the uh, open circles are the uh, map uh, expectations, right? And the little vertical line segments there are the confidence intervals uh, of the expected value of mu, right? So the open circle is where mu is for that state using its predictor values. Uh, the little line segment then is the uh, confidence interval on that um, posterior interval, percentile interval on mu. And then the little pluses show you the sim uh, using sigma to get the actual prediction envelope for where it is. And so if the model's doing a, uh, a good job, right, it'll, uh, well, if you, if you, as I'll show you next week, we could always get those blue dots right on the uh, open circles if we had enough parameters, right? If I had a parameter for every state, I could bullseye it every time. We'll do that next week. <laughs> uh, uh, it'll get close. You notice for some states, it gets really close. Like case nine, uh, the blue dot is basically right on the expectation. That's a well-behaved state. It's right on the regression line. Um, these predictions take into account all the predictors. In this case, there's only two of them. But if you had 100, it would use them all. It would just put them on here. So this is the way the model sees the, sees the data, sees the prediction. Um, and this is what it was fitting on, the scale it was fitting on. Notice for other states, it does a pretty bad job. But sometimes it's even outside of the, the plus envelope, right, of the predictions there. Um, so you can see uh, uh, some of the cases. That said, th these plots are pretty ugly, right? It's just the default. Uh, Post-check doesn't know anything about your purpose. You can do better. And so let me show you a few that are a little bit better, that are alternatives in this case. And the code for making them uh, is in the book. So if you're interested in these, you can step through it and figure it out. Uh, that yeah, a quick question. On the post-check, would it be a lot prettier of a graph if you just sorted the cases by their divorce rate? Like, would that make it easier to see the pattern of the model? Yeah, so the question was, what if you sort by divorce rate? We're going to do that okay. in like a couple slides. But I, I agree completely. Okay. You can always do better than post-check. Post-check, it's like I made it ugly and I refuse to make it prettier because I want to motivate you to do better. right? So like, so I say, my graphs are ugly. They don't use ggplot or anything. They're just <laughs> gross. <laughs> and that's no accident. It's not only because I'm lazy. It's because I'm also spurring you to draw your own fancy stuff using what you know about the nature of your data. You can make it better. Uh, absolutely, you can. Uh, so I don't have any kind of like Tufty-esque ideology about making my graphs ugly. 
like it's some like Spartan, some of you know Edward Tufte is actually he's a hero of mine. I think he's he's a really smart person, but he's got this Spartan attitude towards ink. Like every drop of ink is precious. Uh, it's like a Monty, old Monty Python song. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I don't have that ideology. I think I think graphs have lots of functions and uh, depends upon your audience. Uh, but I, in this context, for your own analysis, usually your knowledge of the variables helps you make a more effective graph. So exactly in this case, you want to sort them. Makes you see, helps you see the pattern. Um, so here's a case where all I've done is it's the same calculations uh, for the most part that were on the previous one, although we're just looking at the mu's and the confidence interval of the mu's at each state for the moment. On the horizontal is the actual observation, the divorce rate that was really observed in each state. And on the vertical is the model-based prediction. So the vertical has the uncertainty. That's where those bars come from, right? That's the posterior uncertainty for each state. Notice that it varies, uh, right? Why? Because some states are close to the middle of the regression line, and some of them are really out on the end. Remember the bow tie? That one gets broader. So some states will be have left con less confident predictions than others as a consequence of that. You can really see that here. Um, and then this uh, diagonal dashed line shows where they're the same. That's the equality line. So any state that's right on that is, is the model's doing a perfect job, so to speak. Um, could still be a wrong model. Uh, one second, I'll get your question. Uh, and then uh, for states above, their predicted divorce rates are too high. Right? The model over-predicted divorce for those states. Right? So those so another way to say that is for the states above the line, they had lower divorce rates than the model thought. Notice that uh, Idaho and Utah are up there. Does anyone know something about Idaho and Utah, other than they grow potatoes? Uh, Mormons, that's right. And so these are anomalous states because they have an anomalous population, right? Well, anomalous is the wrong word. I have some dear friends who are Mormon. I'm very fond of, of the LDS Church in a lot of ways, uh, ironically. Anthropologists have a complicated relationship with the LDS Church, but it's mainly, mainly a good one. <laughs> and uh, uh, there are different populations with different sets of norms and different marriage attitudes. The community is much more involved. Uh, actually, I think that's the main thing. And so they, they stand out. The model does a really bad job with them. So this is a case where you say that the posterior check helps you notice cases, and you realize something. Of course this model does a bad job with those states, because I didn't take account of the fact that they're different community structures. Um, question over here. Yeah, so it seems like the, the dotted line, the points that are close along the dotted line would have low or small error bars. Typically, am I understanding that correctly? Because there's the, the, the point in the bottom left there that has these huge. Yeah, this one has really big ones, right? Yeah, so what, it still ones? depends upon its particular combination. So there's this plane with the two predictors in it, and it's where you're dislocated on that plane from the center of gravity of that plane. So there could be combinations of median age and marriage and marriage rate, which get you on the line, but are extreme values. So that point is actually... Yeah, they are, so we'd have to pull it apart. This is a collapsing of those two dimensions. So, but it's a good question. Uh, and I can't, I don't have a visualization. I think that shows that very well, uh, but it's a great question. So yeah, it depends. I mean, you can end up on the regression line because you have a particular combination of the two predictors that put you there, or because you have average values of the predictors. Right? And there'd be a bunch, there's an infinite number of combinations of the two predictors that'll get you on that line, and they'll have different uncertainties depending upon where they are. So if that helps. Um, I hadn't thought to do that visualization, but that's a good question. This is how the course gets marginally better every year, I think, uh, as a consequence of questions like this. So, so I, do, I do appreciate them. Um, okay, uh, anything else about this? No? All right. I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'm right on schedule. This is beautiful. Uh, so uh, here's the sorting. This is what Cody wanted, I think. Um, here's a more rational way to look at it. Now, I only apologize that this, this plot's very compressed. Probably would have been better to do it in two columns. But um, I wanted to get show you the sorting, show you this nice S-curve that you get out of it. Uh, here, we're, I'm computing residuals. So again, you compute a prediction for each state using both predictors. And then look at the difference between the observed and the predicted. And that's a residual on the outcome scale. These are the model residuals, the total model residuals, sometimes they're called. And so this zero line on this graph, uh, so let's say each row on this plot is a state. You can probably tell from the state abbreviations. And there's a zero line and a thin hair line going up where uh, uh, a state is right on the <coughs> model-based expectation. Any state that's right on there is right where the model expects it to be, average state, according to the re regression relationship. Um, Ones with negative residuals have less divorce than the model expected, 
right? So then there's Idaho down here is our far outlier. Idaho has very little divorce relative to other. And I think Idaho has the highest proportion of, of LDS of any state, right? Even then Utah now, I think. Because uh, it used to be almost no one living in, in uh, uh, Idaho except for like bugs that ate potatoes. For a lot of them, because <laughs> the main <laughs> the main animal population of Idaho, I think, was like potato weevils <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, apologize to apologize to anyone. <laughs> yeah, apologies to anyone from Idaho. But it's a beautiful place, actually. Just don't go there in the winter. But it's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, so no, I think I think it's true down. Uh, so Utah's down here too, right? Uh, it's down in the bottom. And then there are states. Like Maine, bless their hearts, <laughs> uh, where it's a very positive result. There's a lot more divorce than expected. Uh, in Maine, it, it has a low divorce rate, and all of them, you know, I should say all of them, but there's a lot of divorce. Uh, it's, it's an odd. Uh, Maine is a very unusual state in lots of ways, though. My political scientist colleagues talk to me about Maine as the case that no model predicts Maine. Uh, it's, it's really, really odd. They, they have a lot of progressive ideals mixed in with uh, conservative ideals, and they don't look like the national kind of partisan landscape. Uh, and their local politics are different and, and so on. So I don't know the truth of that, but uh, they're at the other, they anchor the other extreme of bad model performance here, right? The model does a bad job of picking their divorce rate as well. So, and now you can see sometimes you get, you get different amounts of confidence uh, depending upon the combinations. And you can go through and then audit those and see... Uh, I, I think that, you know, yeah, like North Carolina will have an extreme value in one of those predictors, so it'll put it out in the plain somewhere marginally on the plus. Um, and yeah, Washington, D.C. is just average, just except for homicide. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which predictor gives you as a star? This is the, at the end, we compute a prediction for each state, an expected divorce rate for each state out of the model, say the map prediction, and then subtract that from the observed divorce rate. And that's all I'm plotting on the horizontal axis here. And again, the code for this is in there. And when you, when you play with the code, you'll see what's going on. Uh, and again, this is not necessarily the right graph, but it does show you something. It helps you do a quick audit where it's doing well and where it's doing worse. And the goal isn't to get all these right on the line, because uh, next week I'll show you how to do that. And that we like madness. Uh, that's, that's a very bad thing to do. Uh, but first of all, you say, it's, it's, uh, is it fitting right? In this case, it is. Um, uh, and then you, it inspires the imagination by noting, for example, the LDS population uh, is, a, is a clear thing. Yeah, David. So on the last slide, um, it's probably somehow demonstrated here too. The higher the actual divorce rate, the more likely the model is to under predict divorce and vice versa. Is that something that, well, we're just fine with it, or are you looking for a model that Sort of where well, the circles are randomly distributed around the line. Uh, so I think the question was, uh, let me try to translate. Can you, sure, you tell me if I got it right? So what we observe here is that this cloud of points is kind of like lazy, right? I mean, if it was really clinging to the diagonal, it'd be right up here. Uh, apologies to those of you watching at home. You can't see my gesticulations. But um, instead, it's kind of droopy on the right. It droops below the line, and then it, it rises above the line on the left. Uh, so that's a typical thing that regression models do. That's the regression to the mean phenomenon. Uh, you, you don't actually want a model that exactly replicates your data, because then you can't learn anything from your data. Uh, so this will happen a lot with regressions, and it's a symptom, again, of the regression phenomenon. Um, if if uh, uh, you had infinite data and an infinite amount of complexity, you'd get all those points exactly on the line, um, but we don't want to do that. Uh, so this is fine, one way to think about it. Uh, but still, the, the posterior predictive checks or retributive checks, if you prefer, um, help you figure out, okay, before the ones where the models do a particularly bad job, is there something obvious about them? And that's why I've, I've highlighted Idaho and Utah. I think systematically, you know, if, if I knew more about the demography of marriage, maybe there'd be something obvious or two about the states on the far right, but I don't know. Um, but, right, but this often, this nearly always happens in regressions. Okay. Especially if we do some regularization, which we'll talk about next week. It's a very important thing to do. Okay, I have five minutes, and I'm right on schedule. So let me show you, though, um, you can take the residuals that are in that big column of posterior predictive checks there, and uh, you can regress Waffle Houses per capita on that, and there's still a certain association. Uh, so even after all this work, I've taken out both of the marriage variables. It's still true that Waffle House is predict divorce. That's just not very much. Uh, it's not a it's not a huge effect, right? You can see that the ninety five percent 
confidence envelope there is, is hidden horizontal. Uh, but it's still associated, so I still don't believe it. Uh, right? I still don't believe it. But, so there must be something else lurking in here. Uh, not sure what's going on. We're going to come back to these data in the last week um, uh, and do something which I think actually totally removes this. Uh, uh, there's error in measurement on these variables. And it varies a lot across the sample. Why? Because in small states, there's a lot of uncertainty about the rates. In large states, there's very little uncertainty about the rates. And population size is associated with the presence of Waffle Houses. Uh, and I think that's actually what's going on here. We'll come back to that. And I'm going to teach you how to put measurement error into your models in the last week. Because there's measurement error on all these variables. Uh, right? Because we don't, we don't actually sample everybody. These, these national statistics are done by sampling. Uh, right? Because that's how bureaucracies work. Okay. Um, this might be a great place to stop. Yes, it probably is. So instead of, I'll give you your, your four minutes free, uh, and instead of starting into mass dissociation, um, when you come back, we'll pick up with this slide, and we'll deal with the other case. So we just dealt with spurious correlation, a case where there's some predictor that seems associated with the outcome, but really isn't, uh, or rather it's associated, but not once we account for something else which is really driving the cause uh, of the outcome. There are other cases where multiple things are all causing the outcome, but they have their effects are in different directions. So they antagonize one another. And if you don't account for both of them in the model, you end up concluding that neither of them is associated with the outcome. And they both are. And I'm going to call that masking, and I'll walk you through that when you come back on Thursday.